Well, this is the image that I was looking for. Here, here we've got uh, some really creative person has drawn this GIF, GIF. And uh, you can see that they didn't do a very good job drawing, drawing ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium because that looks squamous. But um, here you can see the lovely way that they drew the cilia. And in green, that is the mucus. Here we have got goblet cells inside of the epithelium and that those goblet cells make that mucus. And that mucus is a layer. It's got to be not too thin or else it's water and it'll run down not too thick or these cilia can't move it. But on the way down, uh, bacteria and pieces of dust, pieces of dust like off of a dusty pathway, um, those things are in the air that you're inhaling, but they land on that mucus, they get stuck, and then you see, oh, he's so sad. He's going to head upwards, and the next thing you know, he'll get swallowed um, because this mucus is being moved to the... Um, it's being moved to the pharynx. By the way, this mucociliary escalator, it's not only here, it's also in your nose. And actually, we've probably all experienced this where we went on a really dusty hike or maybe we went horseback riding or something like that. And at the end of the day, you blow your nose and you realize that you brought some of the trail home with you. And the reason that happens is because of the quality of the mucus. By the way, there is a birth defect called cystic fibrosis. It is a genetic mutation that makes it so that the mucus that the lungs make in those children is not uh, the right consistency. It's too thick. And because it's too thick, it's very difficult for the cilia to move it. And since the cilia cannot move, it stays down in the lungs and it ends up being a pretty good place for bacteria to survive. Um, and so children with cystic fibrosis get pneumonia a lot. Um, I told you that there were relevant issues um, in this series with the coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, however you want to call it, um, that uh, are related to this topic. And one of them is that when the virus uh, uh, infects the cells that line your respiratory tract, then these guys are not very happy. There are fewer cilia that are moving, so the mucus doesn't move well. And another side effect of the inflammation caused by the virus is this mucus ends up being not the right consistency. It ends up being too watery, and it'll have a tendency to just run down and pool in the inferior lung lobes. Okay. Oh, good. Let's talk about the bronchial tree. We always call it the bronchial tree. And the reason that it got called the bronchial tree is that it's shaped like a tree. You've got, a, let me turn this upside down. Okay, you have got a main trunk, that would be like your trachea. Then you've got big uh, branches that might be your primary bronchi. They split into secondary bronchi and tertiary bronchi. And ultimately we're going to have twigs, those will be the bronchioles. And the alveoli could be represented here by the leaves, right? Now, this is a human bronchial tree. Um, but before we talk about the human bronchial tree, let's go back here for a second. Whenever we're thinking about the bronchial tree in a physiology or anatomy class, I'm sure we're mostly thinking about these tubes. So the tubes are super important. These are the airways. These are the tubes that things will travel by. What very often gets lost on us, I know it was on me, is that this branching pattern of the tubes is exactly the same as the branching pattern of the blood vessels. What does that mean? That means the pulmonary artery, blue blood, right, is following this tube out like that. And the pulmonary vein is following it on the other side, coming back and back to the heart, right? On either side of each of these airways, bronchi, bronchioles, either one, there is an artery and a vein. How's that important? Let's go back here again. Let's imagine that I've got a tree in my front yard and my tree has gotten a tumor, all right? I don't know if trees get tumors, but let's just imagine the tree does. That tumor's right there, okay? So I call the tree tumor guy out to my house and I say, I would like you to please remove that tumor. And the tree trimmer guy looks at it and says, sure, I'd be happy to take off that branch. And I say, no, 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 don't, don't take off the branch. Just take out the tumor, leave the branch. Okay, it'd be crazy, right? Crazy. 
See, that's the thing with the anatomy of the lungs. If there is a tumor that is sitting right here in the lung, a surgeon literally cannot just go in and remove the tumor. Because by removing the tumor, now there's no way for air to get from here to there. And on top of that, there'd be no way for blood to get out from here to here and no way for blood to get back. And that is why removing tumors from lung tissue is entirely different from removing them almost anywhere in the body. Because whenever you remove a tumor from the lung, you have to remove that tumor and then all of the tissue that branches off of that region. And that's what this image is. This image is showing you the individual lobules of the lung. So if there were a tumor right here, I would remove it by removing all of that, right? If there were a tumor right here on this red part, I'd need to remove that tumor and all of that red stuff. They're called wedge resections. One of the several reasons why lung cancer caused by cigarette smoking is such a dastardly thing is that lung cancer caused by cigarette smoking usually creates tumors in the primary bronchus. So in order to remove that kind of a tumor, you end up having to remove one entire lung, half of a person's lung capacity. And even if that did save lives and it generally wouldn't, but even if it did, it really diminishes the quality of life. One of the many things that makes lung cancer, particularly the one caused by cigarette smoking, really hard to treat. Let's talk about some more physiology. We're going to start talking about factors that affect resistance to airflow, resistance to airflow, resistance to airflow. How easy is it to get air down to those alveoli? How easy, easy is it for all that air to come back out again, right? And there are two main factors that influence how easy it is to breathe. One is pulmonary compliance. Pulmonary compliance is how easily does the lung stretch. Your lung, if you were to look at it through a microscope with special stains, you would see it has a tremendous amount of that protein elastin. Elastin is elastic, it's stretchy, right? And so when your young lungs are young and healthy, uh, it is very easy to stretch your lungs, and when you let go, they empty themselves like a brand new rubber balloon, okay? That's good pulmonary compliance. The older we get, the more some of that elastin gets replaced with collagen. Collagen is a lovely protein. I got nothing against collagen, but it's not very good at stretching. So the more the elastin gets replaced with the collagen, the harder it is to take a deep breath. And when a lot of that elastin gets replaced, instead of passively being able to exhale, we'll talk about that later, sometimes you have to act actively use muscles to push air out of your lungs. One of the reasons why we don't want people to smoke cigarettes is that cigarette smoking decreases pulmonary compliance. Another thing that decreases pulmonary compliance is just living in air pollution. Those of us that have lived in the LA area for a long time, our lungs is, are not as healthy as if we would have grown up someplace with beautiful clean air, all right? So pulmonary compliance. The second thing that affects resistance to airflow is the diameter of the bronchioles, the bronchiolar diameter. Now, uh, uh, let's talk about the bronchi and the bronchioles. I, I know that in my mind, I, I have to admit, that I think of venules as just really small veins and I think of arterioles as really small arteries, they're not. And for a long time, I thought of bronchioles as just really small bronchi. Oh, but they're not, okay? And you should know that one of the biggest differences is that the bronchioles, they don't have any cartilage in their wall. Your trachea has got those cartilage rings, the bronchi have got shields of cartilage. Why is that important? That cartilage props those tubes open so that even when there's vacuum inside of the tube, they will not collapse on themselves. In addition to that, there is smooth muscle wrapped around all of these airways. There is smooth muscle there. Now, let's imagine that my hands are going to be uh, the cartilage and there's smooth muscle wrapped around. When that smooth muscle contracts, 
okay? It'll make the tube smaller, but how small that tube will get will be limited by that piece of cartilage that's there in the wall. Bronchioles don't have cartilage at all. Since they're just a little old tube, when the smooth muscle contracts, they can contract super tiny, right? So bronchiolar diameter is a very important factor uh, for the resistance to airflow. When you've got a lot of epinephrine in your system, fight or flight, right? Sympathetic nervous system. Um, then uh, you are going to have really big airways. And those really big airways are gonna make it so that air can go in really easy, in and out, so that you can run from the bear, right? And uh, when you're just um, in parasympathetic state, rest and digest, all of your airways get smaller because smooth muscle constricts. Now, I used to suffer from asthma very badly. And one of the things that I wanted to know when I found this out was, you mean, I'm only having asthma attacks because someone wrapped smooth muscle around my airways. What brain surgeon did that, right? Because, you know, from your point of view, you're thinking to yourself, hey, I don't need my airways to get any smaller. Ah, but you do. Let's go back here. Okay. Here. All right. Here. Okay. So here are your airways. I could have gone anywhere. Here are your airways. Now you might think, oh, they're just status quo. But the truth is that when they are fully dilated because you're running from a bear, there is, there is dust that is able to avoid your mucociliary escalator. So on those times when epinephrine is causing you to take in big gulps of air, your alveoli are getting dirty. And we're gonna talk about it in a little bit, but the alveoli, they don't have a very good way to clean themselves back out again. So all the dirt that ends in the alveoli, some of it will be there for the rest of your life. We don't want that. So when we don't need big gulps of air, our airways are shut down quite a bit to maximize how clean and humid and warm that air will be when it gets down to the alveoli. Here's the problem. The problem is when people have problems like asthma or particularly allergic asthma, then they will get a tremendous amount and unreasonable amount of bronchoconstriction or bronchiolar constriction. You know, in all of us, even if you don't have asthma, if you step outside of a warm house and into some really frigid air, you will get an asthma attack. Your airways will constrict. That's what they're meant to do. They're meant to constrict to protect your alveoli. But when you've got allergic asthma, this is happening when it is not useful. Let's talk a little bit more about allergic asthma. We're looking at some lung tissue through the microscope. And I wanna emphasize that on this microscope image, everything that's white, that is someplace that there would only be air. Now, look at that. Your lungs are much more made out of air than they are made out of you, right? The only part that is you is all of this sort of purpley red line. That's the only stuff that is you. All of that white stuff, air you just inhaled, okay? Now this is a healthy bronchial. You'll notice that it's got a little bit of smooth muscle and that's all. And our airways are just lovely and filled with air, okay? We're going to start there at the beginning of our next video.